All right, let me ask this question as we get started with this. Have you ever believed something about someone that you had like presuppositions about them, which means you presupposed that they were a certain way, and then you start to get to know them, and you realize that you were absolutely wrong in what you first thought about them. Anybody ever do that before? Raise your hand. Maybe I'm the only guy. It's one of those things we put our foot in our mouth, you know, situation, right? And, and um, I, I remember, I've done it so many times, it's ridiculous. But one time, uh, back a, a number of years ago in Iowa, when, we were, uh, when I was pastoring there, we lived there, there was a six foot eight. 400 pound dude, okay, massive dude, and then his wife, and they came to service, and as I watched them, and I got to meet them during the greeting time, and all these other things, I was like, they're not, they're not digging this, they're probably not ever going to come back, kind of a thing, okay, today, Dan and Stephanie are Holly, some of Holly and I's best friends, they became key leaders within the church when we were there, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. like, I couldn't have been more wrong and my first impression and my presuppositions about them. If you think about this, most thriller movies and novels are built on this concept of making you think a person is good when then they turn out to be bad. Or like when you're watching the movie, you're like, I'm a movie guy, okay? So if, I guess for those, if you're reading the book, it's foreign to me. But anyway, like when you're watching the movie, you're reading the book, and then you think someone is a, is a bad guy, but then they actually end up being a, a hero or something, right? They, they, the whole concept is to twist it. And, and so it's very familiar to us to have these presuppositions about someone and then find out that we were wrong. Now, here's the next question. When we found out that we were wrong, the next question is, sorry, I am so uh, OCD. There, that's centered. Okay, um, but when we found out we were wrong, what did we do at that moment? And what did we feel at that moment? Okay, and, and so did we change our mind then? Is that, oh, I was wrong, and change our mind? Or did we fight that and try to stick to our presuppositions about them, our pre-thoughts about them, our initial thoughts uh, about them. And so what we're going to see today in Mark chapter 6 is we're going to see a whole city of people have wrong presuppositional thoughts about who Jesus is, and we're going to learn from their poor choices as we check that out. Okay, so let's review really quick. For those of you who were here last week, help me refresh and remind and catch everybody else up that wasn't here last week, okay? So last week in, the, in Mark, we, we saw in chapter 5 that Jesus was in a city called Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and he heals two people. He heals two people. Remind me, who are the two people? Woman that was having internal bleeding for how many years? 12 years, and then also, who, who, what, who else was uh, needed healed? Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, right? So we saw this amazing thing. Now, here's what's interesting with both of these scenarios. This internal bleeding woman for 12 years who can't get healed, this 12-year-old daughter who literally, by the time you read through it, she actually literally dies. Her dad and this woman, they are in desperate des- need of God to show up. It's gotten from bad to worse, And then Jesus steps in. But here's what we really saw from that, is that we need, you and I today, as God's people, we need to make sure we never give up doing what God has called us to do in our life. Never give up. A lot of times, God will come in and he will save us and rescue us from a trial that we're going through as we are serving him and doing his will for our life. But sometimes, he's not going to step in, and that trial may literally take our life, but here's the thing, we got to make sure we still don't give up. we got to keep doing what God has called us to do, even if to our last breath. That's what we saw last week, okay? Now, let's pick up in verse six, or sorry, chapter 6, verse 1, and it says this, Jesus went away from there, that's Capernaum, and came to his hometown. Anybody know what his hometown was? Nazareth. Now, what city was he born in? Bethlehem. But then they moved to Nazareth, Israel. That's where he grew up. That's where he actually lived until he's about 30 years old. Okay, for a long time. Nazareth, that's where he's going. So I got a video. We'll see if it worked. It wasn't working earlier, but here's Capernaum. Thank you, Jesus. It worked. Okay, and as you see, here's Nazareth today. Okay, so if you notice, we went southwest 
from the Sea of Galilee, from Capernaum. It's 20 miles away. Uh, the average distance that a, a human being can hike in a day is 20 miles. So Jesus and his disciples, uh, except for some of your cr crazy hikers, you guys do way more, but um, Jesus and his disciples spend a whole day hiking from Capernaum now to Jesus' hometown. Now, in those days, Nazareth had about 20,000 people, so a good-sized city. Um, there would have been multiple synagogues, places of worship for the Jewish people like churches today. Now, here's what's interesting. This time that Jesus, and we're reading about right now, this is his second time there since he started his public ministry of miracles and preaching and so forth. The first time that Jesus went back to his hometown after starting his ministry is actually recorded in Luke chapter 4. And in that, it was an amazing event because Jesus goes to some of the synagogues. He goes to one of the synagogues, and he preaches the sermon. They let him come up and, and preach a sermon. And so I want you to hear the presuppositional first thoughts and feelings that the Nazarenes had about their homeboy, Jesus. Okay, they all knew him. This is his family, his relatives, his friends, his neighbors. Here's what happened in Luke 4, 22. You can just, I'll just read it. You know, it's on the screen. In verse 22, all the people spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? So that's pretty positive, right? They're marveling at his teaching. He's so gracious and, and, and so forth. Very positive first impression by the Nazarenes of Jesus. Now get this, tw verse 22. Seven, you know, six verses later, verse 28, when they heard these things, so what happened was he opens his mouth and keeps preaching, and look what happens within a minute. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Literally, a minute later, they are excited, think he's awesome, gracious words, amazing guy. Within a minute, because he kept talking, and uh, they were filled with wrath. They rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. He supernaturally got away. People go from their first thought of loving Jesus to within a minute or so, wanting to throw him off a cliff. Here's a picture of that cliff in Nazareth. I've seen it, I've been there. You can imagine they throw someone off that. You're not surviving that fall. It's still there today. So here's the thing. Jesus is going back to the hometown where people tried to throw him off a cliff about a year or so before this event in Mark. Why in the world is Jesus going back? Well, does he have dementia? Right? Maybe, you know, he's forgot this. Or is it that Jesus is a man of steel? Is it that Jesus is not afraid? Is it that Jesus is not just a human, but he is God, and that no one can touch him like they did try the first time, and no one, he has no fear of man whatsoever, but also it's that Jesus is so loving He's willing to go back to this people who tried to kill him to give them another opportunity to repent and believe and have their soul saved. So which option, dementia or that Jesus? It's the latter, right? So Jesus is going back. Guys, I love that. Listen, we, we serve and we worship a man of all men. We serve and worship an amazing Jesus Christ. We serve and we worship a Jesus who is not afraid of anybody. And listen, that same spirit of God that, that was with him is within us. So brothers and sisters in Christ, keep praying for the Spirit to give you thick skin. Keep praying for the Spirit to give you boldness and courage because I'm living proof of someone who used to be a shy little high school kid back in the day to where I'm standing in front of a crowd of people right now. And I'm telling you, man, I used to get hives on my neck from doing something like this. Okay? God can change you because that's the kind of Jesus that we serve. I'm about to start preaching. We better watch out. Okay, let's go on. All right, so let's look, up, look back at Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus went away from there, came to his hometown, Nazareth. His disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. 
And many who heard him were astonished. Now, the, either he went back to the same synagogue and they were like, okay, we're going to give him another chance, you know, from the last time. Or he went to a different synagogue. We don't know. Either way, they're, but once again, they were astonished at his preaching, at his teaching. And, and they were saying, where did this man get these things? What, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? They're talking about the miracles. Uh, uh, is not this the carpenter? Jesus was a carpenter. I need to grow in that area of my life. Um, the, he's the son of Mary. They know mom, Mary, and the brother James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon. So here's his brothers. They know them all. They're, this is his hometown, and, and, are, and, and are not his sisters here with us? Jesus had a whole big family of brothers and sisters, and Mary. Of course, Joseph probably died by this point. That's why they're not asking about him or referring to him. And then here it is. They're astonished, but then all of a sudden, as they think about these things, they get offended. Look at that. And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives in his own household. And he could not do mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Listen to this. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. He went from there because they didn't believe that his own relatives, distant relatives and friends, they rejected him again for the second time because they didn't believe because verse 6 says he was marveled at their unbelief. In other words, Jesus is like, guys, listen. If anybody on planet earth could know that I'm a special person, I am the God Messiah that has come to save you, it should be you guys because you guys have watched me live from childhood through my about 30 years old of my life as a carpenter and all these things, and you've noticed I'm a special person. I've never sinned. Surely that would stick out, that you met someone and, and you really get to know them, and they're like, I don't think I've ever seen them do one bad thing. That, that should be markably noticeable. And, and he, so he's marveled at this. Of course, then you add to that that they've heard about all these miracles he's doing. He's done some of the miracles in town, not a lot. But, you know, they're seeing that. They're hearing him preaching in a way as if he is the God who wrote the Bible that the sermon is on. Because he is the God that wrote the Bible that he's preaching from. And so they were astonished. They should have known Jesus is marveled that they could have so much evidence in front of them and still not believe in who he really was. Wow. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to answer two questions. First of all, who is the real Jesus that they did not believe in, that you and I need to believe in today? Who is that real Jesus versus fake Jesuses? Secondly, after Jesus revealed himself in all these different ways to them, why did the Nazarenes still reject and not believe him? And are some of those reasons why they did still something that maybe some of us have in our life today? Okay? So the first thing, who is the real Jesus? What I'm going to do today is I'm going to cover seven, I'm going to address seven potential false Jesuses, views of Jesus that are not biblically accurate, they are not real Jesuses that can save us, and I'm going to give you the real Jesus, okay? So the first one is uh, people who believe Jesus was only a really good teacher. So a lot of people, and I think of like a bullseye, okay? When you think about it, like the bullseye, this is the real Jesus, and the rest of them are false Jesuses, so you're, you know, so you're throwing a dart on these, and then this one doesn't even get close to it, right? It doesn't get the bullseye. It's a Jesus that's a, only a really good teacher, and um, a lot of people through history have, have thought this. Just recently, I know of a Canadian philosopher, a really popular guy, and, and he believes Jesus was a really good teacher, but he's not believing that Jesus is God in the flesh that can save him from his sins. He's not there yet. We're praying for him. But the point is, a lot of people are, are, are in awe of his teachings and, and the beautiful things he said, right? But it's a false Jesus who can't save you if he's only a teacher and not God who can save you. Because Jesus many, many times claimed to be God. Jesus did things only God can do, and only a God, Jesus, can save us. The Nazarenes, they were in this camp. They thought he was just a really good teacher, 
is their friend, their family member, their friend that grew up in town, and somehow he got really good at teaching the Bible, but that's all he was to them to a degree. Again, verse 2, it says, On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that is given to them? They're, they're amazed by his teaching, but they didn't believe that he was God, Messiah, that could save them from their sins. Okay, so that's a false Jesus if, if we believe that. Secondly, some people think that he was just a really good prophet, maybe also a good teacher mixed into that, but he was just a, a good prophet. In other words, he, he definitely is doing supernatural things, but it's God doing through him as a prophet, but he's still just a man. He's still just a man. He's not the God Messiah, okay? A lot of people through history, Muhammad, Islam, that's their view of Jesus, He's not God, he's just a prophet. He's a good prophet, an important prophet, but that's all he is, and then a good teacher tied within that. The Nazarenes, they also believe this about him. They, they didn't deny that he was doing these supernatural miracles. They, they were in awe of that, okay? So they see him as a prophet and a teacher, but not the real saving Jesus. It's a false Jesus. Uh, some people, they believe that Jesus is more like a genie Jesus, you know how genies work, right? Genies, you rub it, and the genies got to do what you want them to do, you know? And, and, and there's a lot of people even still today that they, this is the kind of their view of Jesus, is that he's there to, to serve us whenever we want for whatever we want in our life, but he's not God who deserves to be worshiped and served. He's not Lord. He's not king. He's a genie to serve us, Jesus. Guys, that's a false version of Jesus, that's a Jesus who will not save us. Instead, Jesus is the God-man, uh, Jesus, that deserves to be worshipped. To where his own disciple, Thomas, eventually said to him in John 20, 28, he said, my Lord and my God. Does that sound like what you're talking to a genie about? Like, you see? No, he's, you're my Lord, you're my God. You deserve for me to worship you. By the way, Jesus didn't say, no, 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 I'm just a man. Don't, don't worship me. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus let him worship him. Why? Because Jesus is God. Now, but here's the thing. God, King Jesus, doesn't exist to serve us like a genie does. Right? The Nazarenes, they wanted Jesus to serve them with the miracles. Uh, in verse 2, it says, how, how are such mighty works done by his hands? And actually, when you study the first time in Luke 4 that Jesus was there, you know, what, you know what, um, why they hated him within six verses, within a minute? It's because Jesus said to them, you're, I'm paraphrasing, read it for yourself. Your hearts are on, on the wrong place. I'm not going to do all these miracles for you. In other words, they wanted Jesus to be the prophet, teacher, genie, to serve them, do all the miracles in their hometown. He's like, I'm not going to do it. And they were filled with rage and wrath. And there's other reasons tied within that. And then that's when they go to throw him off the thing. Because he wasn't the genie that they thought and wanted him to be. Guys, that's not how Jesus is. He's not a genie. He is the Lord. And he exists to do what he wants to do. And we, we should exist to worship him and to serve him, not him serve us. Okay. So that's a false Jesus. Here's a fourth Jesus. We've got seven false Jesuses. Fourth one. Some people think that Jesus is a grace-only kind of Jesus. He's, he's all loving. He's so loving. He's so nice. He's going to accept us no matter what we think, no matter what we do, because he's so loving. And even if I'm not sorry for it, he's going to still, because he's so loving, he's just going to accept me anyway. That's true love. That's who Jesus is. You know, he's the teddy bear Jesus. He's the hugs and muffins Jesus. He's the, you know, come over here and just cuddle with me no matter what you're doing because I'm so loving, I'll just like act like you're not doing it kind of Jesus. And where the epitome of this can go is what we call universalism. You ever heard of universalism? Universalism is the idea that, thank you, Jesus, that you died and rose from the dead. And now because you did that, everybody's going to get to heaven, whether they believe in you or repent of their sins or not, because you are a universal, loving Jesus, grace only Jesus. Guys, if that's your view of Jesus, that's a false Jesus. That is not the real Jesus. Let me share with you what God says about himself and about Jesus in John 1.14. 
John 1, 14, in the word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us because he's God. He came into this world as a man. That's what it's saying. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father. And here it is, full of grace. Awesome. And help me out. Truth. Why didn't you just put a period after grace? Oh, this truth thing. Sometimes truth offends me. You see? I don't like that thing there, Jesus. Just, just accept me. Just let me live my life the way I want. Let me do what I want to do. I just want your grace. I don't want your truth. You see, the Nazarenes, they believe this about Jesus at first. He's so gracious. Listen to his sermon. It's so awesome. But in, in Luke's account, it, the first time he's there, when he opened his mouth after they were so amazed by his gracious words. I love it. It says gracious words. His words were full of truth that were offensive to them. And within a minute, they're throwing, trying to throw him off a cliff. Because he failed them. And they thought he was going to be just this gracious miracle worker who was going to be a genie and serve them and do their thing. And they rejected him, tried to kill him the first time. The second time, they rejected him again. Got, Jesus barely got to do any miracles because no one believed in him. And then eventually Jesus walks away and they, they reject him once again. They probably didn't try to kill him the second time because it didn't work the first time. Think about that. That's kind of cool. So that's a false Jesus, grace only. How about this one, though? This one, I, I find a number of people believe this about Jesus. He's the unloving Jesus. He's ungracious. He's like a tyrant. And he's out there just waiting for you to sin so he can just get on you. You know what I mean? Like he's just mad all the time, Jesus. And then he just makes up all these rules to make your life miserable. All right? Teenagers are in the room. Your parents make all those rules just to make your life miserable. You know? And, and, and as I talk to people who I can tell they, they have this view of Jesus, like he's not loving at all, like he's only about rules and, 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 and things like that. It's interesting. One of the themes I pick up on, I'm not saying this is everybody, I'm just saying there's a theme and a pattern. Sometimes they had fathers that were like that. And they carry that view of their dad now to Jesus. Sometimes they had hmm, righteous anger here. Let it be controlled, Lord. Pastors are priests representing the name of Jesus. Do absolutely evil crap to them. And now they, they view Jesus that way. Guys, listen, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Jesus is beautiful. But again, the Nazarenes, listen again, back in, uh, which one is that? That's in the Luke account. Listen, when they heard these things because he spoke truth, uh, they rose up filled with wrath. They, they rose up, drove him out of the town, tried to kill him, throw him off the cliff, right? You see that there? Because they didn't see the truth that Jesus was saying as actually loving. They thought that now he's all about rules, and they didn't like that, and they rejected it. You know, just, just recently, I was with a table of a bunch of agnostics and atheists just last week, and it was, it was interesting, the one guy next to me, when talking about Christians, he's like, you know, and the Christian God, he's like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, but your God just gives you a bunch, a book full of rules, and that's his view of, G, of God, It's that God is just some rule-making, make you follow it all the time, no concept in him or in many people's lives, that God and Jesus is loving, compassionate, gracious. And even when he gives us truth that might offend us, it's for our good. And even when he disciplines us, it's for our good. And again, we can, we can imagine this with our own parents growing up if we had a good, healthy version of that. That when our parents disciplined us, it wasn't because they hated us. It wasn't because they wanted to make our life miserable. It's because they loved us and they were protecting us and they were helping us be the best person that we are to be. That's the real Jesus. It's a false Jesus to think he's unloving. Here's two more false Jesuses. A created Jesus. The creature Jesus. Jesus is not the creator God. Jesus is a creation of God. Now, in categories of thought, 
That's colossal differences of categories. Creator, creature. Do we all agree? That's, that's pretty big differences. Okay? And so uh, anyone, and this is a, 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 a view of Jesus that's more common than you might think, that people think, no, he's not God the creator. He is a creature created by God. And, and so let me give some of those. One, some people think that he's just a human being. That's what the Nazarenes thought of him. He's just, he's just Joseph and Mary's son, right? Uh, that's what they thought. Uh, they just thought that he was just a human, but maybe, you know, again, a prophet, which means God's working through him, but he's still just a created man. Other people, Mormons, Job's witnesses, believe that, or Mormons think that he is the son of God in a divine way, but not, he is not God himself, He's still created. And same thing for Job's witnesses. He is not God himself. He is a man that's been created. Guys, that is a false Jesus who cannot and will not save us. Jesus, again, time and time again, claimed to be equal with God, claimed to be God in the flesh. We just read to John 1.14 saying that. There's so many others. Man, I could do a whole sermon. Here's just one more one time when Jesus said it elsewhere. He said in John 8.58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, as he's talking to some Jewish people, before Abraham was, he, Abraham lived thousands of years before Jesus. He said, before Abraham was, I am so in other words, Abraham lived thousands of years before. Jesus is saying, I, I existed before Abraham did. I'm older than Abraham, okay? And if you read the whole passage, it's like, well, you're, you're not that old. <laughs> you know? Like they're going back, well, what are you talking about? But it's deeper than that because look at verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw into him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. By the way, there's another time where people try to kill him and he supernaturally went through because he's God. Only God can do that. He's not some cool ninja, okay? Only God can slip through crowds of people that are trying to kill him, okay? So that's already proof right there he's God, that he got away. But again, what he said here, he's older than Abraham. He existed before Abraham. But when he throws out, I am. Hallelujah. Amen. You know where I'm going right here, right? Yeah. Ego a me in the Greek. Jesus takes... On purpose, he said he takes this ego ami name of God. Because back in Exodus, when Moses is sitting there and God is calling Moses to go talk to the people and get them out of the land of Egypt, he says, What name should I give them of the God who is telling me to do this? And God says, Ego ami, it's in the Greek, uh, I am. That's my name. You go tell him. So when Jesus throws out that he's older than Abraham, and then he says, I am, ego ami, the people knew exactly that he was claiming to be the God. I am means I've never had a beginning because God is eternal. And that's why they picked up stones and tried to kill him. In other words, guys, listen, listen. Jesus, you might like him as a good prophet. You might like him as a good teacher. You might like him for all these other things. But if you fall short of saying he is God, the triune God, it, that, that can, you know, then you are believing in a false Jesus. And Jesus doesn't let you just think that he's just a creature. Or a son of God that's been created by God, but he clearly kept calling himself equal with God. He is God in the flesh. Now let me show you why that's so important. It's not just about believing facts for facts sake. Any other Jesus other than Jesus being God in the flesh cannot save you and I from hell. If I believe in a Jesus who is not God in the flesh... It doesn't matter that if I have all the other details about him true. It doesn't matter if I'm trusting wholeheartedly in him. But if that's the Jesus, who, that he's not God in the flesh, but he's a creature, he cannot save me. Here's why. Because the Bible says that every created human being inherits what? Sinful nature. And the only way for my sins and for your sins to be forgiven and paid for, the price of it, of hell to be covered, is a perfect human being has to be crucified and his blood shed. So if there's only a human being and they're all sinners, they have to be perfect. There is no sacrifice for our sins. But God became flesh. And because he's 100% God, he's 100% man. It's what we call in theology hypostatic union. Throw that out at work time or lunch break, and you'll just, people are like, wow, that's amazing. Like, what does that mean? I don't know. My pastor just said it. Okay, but hypostatic union 
is that he's 100% God, 100% man. And because Jesus did that, he bypassed the, the, inher- the um, inherited sinful nature through the virgin birth, right? But he's 100% man, but he's also 100% God. He is perfect when his blood is shed on the cross. He is the only person who could have ever satisfied the wrath of God and the price for our sins, amen? You see, guys, that's why it's important. This isn't just about, well, here's a checklist of things you gotta believe about Jesus just because. Our whole eternity rests on who the real Jesus is, not false Jesus is, all right? Okay, one final false Jesus. It's a necessary but insufficient Jesus. A necessary but insufficient Jesus. Let me try to explain this. We can have all the right facts of the real Jesus that we've addressed today. You can have it all down. He's God in the flesh, triune Jesus, all these things, perfect prophet, teacher, all these things. He died on the cross. He did all of this. But here's the thing. If I believe all those facts of the real Jesus and I believe in him and I trust him to save me, but if I say that he's necessary, but he's not sufficient for me to get to heaven, that is a false Jesus that cannot save you and will not save you. Let me explain. There are people who believe in the right Jesus and all these other things, and they say, I, I gave my life to him, and I believe in him, I'm trusting him. But then you ask him this question. If you're standing before the gates of heaven, and God says, why should I let you in? And they say, well, I believe in Jesus, um, but I'm also doing all these good things, and I'm also trying to stay away from bad things, and I'm hoping I get in. In other words, another way you can ask it is this. Are you absolutely confident that if you die right now, you will go into heaven, yes or no? And if someone says, I hope so, that is exposing that they believe Jesus is necessary, but he's not enough. You see? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to precurse what I'm about to say. Because I know that what I'm about to say, I feel, like, I feel like I'm following the footsteps of Jesus right now at this moment in this sermon. Who, he spoke gracious words, and then he also spoke some truth that was offensive. And it didn't end well sometimes. But so help me God, if I don't say what I'm about to say, for concern that someone might be offended in this room or online. Okay? In other words, I'm about to say something that might offend and has a high chance of offending some people in this room or online. And here's my, my, my prayer, is I want you, before you react, just pray right now and say, God, if I'm about to be offended, I want you to show me why. Okay? Don't be like the Nazarenes. You have a presupposition about Jesus and how it all works and how to get to heaven, but what if it's wrong and you're about to hear that it's wrong? My prayer is you don't react, get angry, but what I'm about to say is because I love you and I care about you. Even more, I care about obeying Jesus, okay? So there's enough precursor, right? Everybody's like, okay, what's he about to say? Here it is, you ready? I say this with all love and compassion. Job's witnesses believe Jesus is necessary but insufficient. He's not able to save you. They also have the wrong Jesus on other fronts too. Mormons believe Jesus is necessary but he's not sufficient. They have a wrong Jesus on other fronts too. You ready? Roman Catholicism. The official teaching of the catechism of Roman Catholicism says and teaches all the time and it's practiced by most people I talk to, is that Jesus is necessary, but he's not sufficient to save me. Now, let me make a clarifier. Once in a while, I'll meet someone who's a Roman Catholic, and as I ask them and I talk about this with them, I'll find that they actually do believe it is by faith alone in Jesus alone that saves me, And what I find out is they heard the true gospel of the real Jesus who is necessary and sufficient from some other way outside of the Catholic Church. 
a radio program, a Bible study, you know, or something in the neighborhood, okay? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is not every Roman Catholic believes this. Do you hear me really clearly saying that? Not every, not every Roman Catholic believes this. But I've found that most do, which makes sense because the official teaching of the Catholic Church, fact check me on this, says, not only, get this, not only says that G- belief in Jesus is not enough to save you, you also need to do good works, you need to do all these good things, and you need to stay away from bad things. The whole doctrine and practice of purgatory is based on this concept. It, it is. And so not only is that true, but again, I, I talk to people all the time, and I'm like, okay, so tell me, you know, like, are you sure you're going to go to heaven? And they say, I hope so. I'll never forget this time I was talking to someone. They, they turned the table and said, wait, wait, are you telling me that if you die right now, you are absolutely confident you will be going into to heaven with Jesus? And I'm like, absolutely. And, they, and I, this was so fascinating to me because their reaction was, well, that must be nice. Then, to be honest with you, I believe there was two motives in that comment. One was sort of a mockery, maybe a little something, but I think there was something deeper too. I wish I could say that. Did you know the gospel of Jesus is called the gospel of peace? I'm way off my notes right now. Peace of what? When I talk to people, and it's not just Catholics, anybody who believes Jesus is necessary but not sufficient, they have no peace. Right now, let the Spirit of God speak to someone today, right now. They have no peace with God. They're hoping. They're working hard. They're doing everything they can, but they have no ultimate peace. Listen, I go to bed every night. I, go, I wake up every morning. I fly every airplane and through the turbulence. And anytime I think I'm about to die, and I'm telling you, I have peace. Amen. That if my life is taken from me, I know exactly where I'm going to be. Because it is by the necessary and sufficient Jesus that I know I'm going to get to heaven. You know what the right answer is when you're standing before the gates of heaven? Why should he let you in? Because I believed and trusted and repented to Jesus Christ. That's it. It is all on him. If I'm wrong, I'm doomed. But if I'm right, I'm in. And anything else, guys, cancels it. So let me theologically prove to you, I'm making a claim here, That believing in the real Jesus of these other details, but not thinking that he's enough and that I also got to do good works and bad works and stay away from bad things, that that I need to, you know, I'm making a claim that that doesn't save you. So let me share with you. This is a whole other sermon for another day, but I'm going to do it as succinctly as possible. Study the whole book of Galatians, and it's saying this point. But jump, so, so there's that, fact check it, study on your own. But for time's sake, I'm, I got to go to the, one of the crux verses in the book. In Galatians chapter 2, okay, before I read it, listen to the context. There's these Judaizers. These are people who were saying, you have to believe in Jesus, necessary, he is the Messiah. Believe in Jesus, but also still do the Old Testament law in order to get into heaven. That's the context, okay? And here's what Paul says, oh, I do not nullify the grace of God Grace of God is what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection for us. That's the grace of God. For if righteousness, that's getting to heaven and perfection of getting to heaven, were through the law, the Old Testament law, then Christ died for no purpose. Okay? So let me break this down because I understand this is a concept that's sometimes hard to get at first. So I came up with this equation uh, to help us understand what, this, what God is saying through this. Okay? Help me out, people. What's that, what's that symbol? Infinity, okay? Jesus' work in Galatians 2.21, uh, I do not nullify the grace of God. The value of Jesus' blood on the cross, being the perfect God-man, is of infinite value to pay for our sins. Can I get an amen in Salvation Church on that one? It's of infinite value. The grace of God, Jesus' work is Perfect life, death and resurrection is of infinite value. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But our works, 
I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give to the poor. I'm going to stay away from bad things. I'm going to do all, all, anything of my work. I'm going to get baptized. Any of these works and not works and negative things, and we're going to stay away from that. When we add that I believe in the real Jesus and everything he did, but I add to that my works, it's a negative infinite value. Because in that verse it says I will nullify the grace of God. Nullify means delete or cancel out. So help me out, mathematicians. Negative or infinity plus negative infinity equals zero. That's what God is saying. As soon as we add anything to what Jesus has done, God is saying you have deleted everything Jesus has done for you, and you are back to doomed to going to hell. Ouch. So it's either true or it's not. And I said this, I say this, listen, listen. I say this with all love because I want so bad for every person that ever hears anything that comes out of my mouth to hear the true and the full gospel of Jesus Christ and to hear of the only Jesus who can save you. And if you are believing in that kind of a Jesus, that it's you, you plus what he's done, you need to repent of that, turn from that, and say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I've been adding to what you did. That is false. I have deleted everything you've done for me from this day forward, Jesus. I believe only in you and what you've done for me. Now listen, you're like, where, where did all the works come in? Once you believe that it's only his work that saves you, then we're saved, and now we do good works to thank him for what he's done for us. Do you see? Now we do good works to glorify him in our life, but it has nothing to do with whether I'm getting into the gates of heaven or not. Okay? So, who's the real Jesus? Are you ready? Here's the real Jesus. He's both God and man, hypostatic union. He is God. He's the creator God. He's sufficient alone to save us. He doesn't need our help. He's gracious, awesome, and truthful at the same time. He is the Lord to be served. He is the prophet, and he is the teacher. He's also 100% man who is the risen man. That is the only true, real Jesus that we must put our faith in. He's the only Jesus that we can save. Now listen, the Nazarenes had presuppositions about Jesus to them, halfway through his sermon back in Luke 4, they thought he was a created man, uh, the son of Mary and Joseph, uh, only gracious genie come to do things for us, a prophet and a teacher, awesome. But they rejected the true Jesus, and he couldn't do miracles in our passage before. You know, they rejected him both times, and they died in their sins unless they ever repented of that. So the first, we had two questions were answered. The one is, uh, who is the real Jesus that they didn't believe in that we need to believe in? That's the real Jesus. Here's the second question, though. This is important. Why didn't they believe then when Jesus shows up and he's telling them, no, listen, I am the Messiah that you should worship. I am the Messiah that you should believe in. I'm more than just your hometown boy. Why, why didn't they believe at that point? What stopped them from believing that he, that, what stopped them from lining up behind Thomas and saying to Jesus, this is weird because I saw you growing up as a kid. This is weird because I remember you making a table for me as a carpenter. But now I understand that you're more than a human. You are my Lord and my God, just like Thomas said. What stopped them from saying we were wrong those of us that are married, you know where I'm going with this. Is it easy or hard when our spouse reveals that we were wrong to say, I was wrong? Teenagers and parents back to teenagers, when we are wrong and it's revealed that we are wrong, is it easy or hard to say, I was wrong? In other words, here's the problem with the Nazarenes in, in mass is there's a heart issue of pride or humility. That's what it is, right? I think there's the next slide there. Were they proud or were they humble? When you're proud, you reject. When you had presuppositions about someone, like the Messiah, for instance, or when you had presuppositions to think that, oh, I have to believe in Jesus, but also do good works, 
Pride will cause us to reject the truth when we hear the truth and to change our mind. We can't admit that we're wrong. We're going to stick to our guns because pride. Where humility is saying, I was wrong. Thank you for showing me that I was wrong. I'm going to change what I think about you. I'm going to change what I believe about you. Let me share with you a few verses that talk about pride and humility to God. Here's James 4, 6. But God gives more grace. Awesome, awesome. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Wow. Here's another one. God said this to his people in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8. He says, do not... Do not now be stiff-necked as your fathers were. You ever, you ever hear that phrase, stiff-neckedness? You ever seen that in the Old Testament? It's a common thing. You know what that means? Anybody here ever had a, a toddler that started throwing a tantrum? It's like they, they, like they tense up as if like, you're not going to tell me what to do, you know? That's the picture God is using of his people when they are uh, being proud and rejecting doing what he is telling them to do. That's pride. He says, don't be like that, but what? Yield yourselves. Yield's getting low. That's humility. That's humility to the Lord, yourselves to the Lord, and come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his fierce anger may turn away from you. Pride and humility. Here's one more. Jesus himself said this elsewhere. He said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you notice, I just talked about uh, children in a bad way, like when they throw the tantrum. But generally speaking, children, especially when, you know, those glory, those really fun days of the children, they, they listen. They're humble. They, they do, you know, they're like, I don't know everything. So mom and dad, tell me what to do. That's what Jesus is drawn on. Look at verse four. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear the humility that he's calling for? So here's my question. Are you proud today or are you humble? And if you say you're humble, praise God. But let me give you some challenges then, if we are saying we're humble. First of all, have you believed in and repented of your sins to the real Jesus today? Have you believed in the real Jesus? We went through a lot, spent a lot of time here talking about false Jesuses, and then, of course, giving you the real Jesus, what we know from revealed word of God scripture. Have you believed in that Jesus and repented of your sins to him? And so here's the thing. If you haven't, Here's the test of humility. If you haven't and you're humble, you will say right now, I have believed a false Jesus. I don't like that. I'm ready to believe and repent to the real Jesus. And so if that's you, I'm going to lead in a prayer right now that you can practice humility and give your life to the real Jesus. Would everybody just close your eyes with me? If that's you, just pray quietly between you and Jesus and just say, Jesus... I believe in you, and I confess that I have not believed in you either at all or in a wrong version of you, but today I humble myself, and I want to say I believe in you, the real Jesus, who's both God and man, who died on the cross, rose from the dead and is able to save me by yourself. Lord, I repent of my sins to you. Please forgive me today. And from the rest of my life today, moving forward, you are my Lord and my God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, let me know because King Jesus says get baptized, okay? And so we're gonna do baptism next week. Let's get you baptized. If that doesn't work, we're gonna plan it out for another time. But make sure you talk to me, but praise the Lord for that. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not off the hook, okay? I'm gonna do one more. I mean, I know it's long, but hey, let it, let it happen, okay? So we may believe in Jesus. We may be children of God. Praise God, praise God. I'm gonna broaden this out just one a little bit more, okay? I have found in my life, my journey with the Lord, 
that I still stiffen my neck sometimes to him in certain ways. I still have these presuppositional thoughts about things that he has said in his word that, that I don't like what I think it's saying. And so I either ignore it altogether or I do intellectual gymnastics to explain away these passages in my life. And so here's the challenge and encouragement. Maybe some of us need to confess and repent of any wrong beliefs that we've been fighting in the word of God as God's people. Maybe there's a wrong belief that we're fighting God and we don't like it, but, but we're fighting it. So let me give you an example. Man, I have so many times that the Lord has humbled me in my view of him in the scriptures about things. And um, one of those times, never forget it, 10 years ago or so, I was spending time with him, 2 Timothy 3.16, all the scriptures are God-breathed from the Lord, useful in teaching and so forth. And um, the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart. Uh, it wasn't audible, but it was so clear. It might as well have been. And the Holy Spirit says, Ryan, do you really believe all of the Bible is really from me? I'm like, yes, of course, Lord. And then he says, so you believe all of it is useful, is what that passage says. And I'm like, absolutely. Are you ready? And the Holy Spirit impresses on me. He sa- he's like, then why are you choosing as a pastor of mine to skip whole sections of it because you don't like them. I was a pastor and I was skipping whole sections of the Bible because I didn't like what I thought it was saying. I'll give you an example. Church discipline to the final phase of excommunication clearly written in Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, elsewhere. I would skip these passages because it didn't fit in my presuppositions of who I thought Jesus really is. How does that sound loving? That doesn't sound loving. How does that work? That doesn't make any sense. I don't like that. Uh, also, I had family members who were part of a cult and they did it. And so I was like, well, that's cultish. And, and, and surely that's not what it really is. I as a pastor would, would never touch on those passages because I was proud in my view of the doctrine It didn't fit what I wanted. And on that day, the Holy Spirit took me to a spiritual woodshed. And he's like, Ryan, if you really believe it's all from me, it's those passages too. And so you need to study and figure out what I mean by them and you need to start kicking it in. And that began a journey, guys. Of, but I, it, it was pride that was keeping me. And when I humbled myself to the Lord, and here I am today to tell you that, that practice alone, get this, is actually one of the most loving things God can do for us. Complete reversal of my wrong views. So here it is. Again, what is it maybe, brothers and sisters, that's in the Bible that we don't like? Okay, I'm gonna say some things. May the Spirit lead as he wants. I don't like that God says clearly in the scriptures that this office of pastor is for men only. I don't like what God says about abortion. I don't like what God says about sexuality and about gender. See, I can keep going, and right now I just manage some buttons being pressed right now, and let that be the Holy Spirit. Listen, let's humble ourselves and stop going to the Creator in the potter as clay, saying this is how you should do things. Let's humble ourselves. Would you guys stand? And we're going to sing and make sure that if there's anything there, guys, let's confess it and give it to the Lord. Amen.